Well, hello, people. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world out there. Welcome to the sixth in our series of Theatre Talk Welcomes and our third, but not our last, Evita chat. So um, <laughs> we'd like to welcome you all here for those of them, the, those of you that are listening and watching after we've done the event. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to hand you over to John Rinaldi, who's um, my other administrator today. Um, we are very lucky and privileged to have with us this afternoon the fabulous Valerie Perry, the lovely Sal Mastretta, <laughs> the amazing Anthony Crivello, and last but no least, Andy Cadiff. <laughs> Welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to hand you over to John. John, over to you. Hello. Hey, first of all, just thank you all for being here. Welcome. It's great to see all your faces. Um, I can't stress enough how much people like John and myself and, and all of our uh, members uh, follow you guys and grew up with you guys. And, you know, we've all seen you do the show, a, you know, a gazillion times. And so, you know, other people may have their their WandaVision and their Marvel and all that, but you guys are really <laughs> our our heroes. So thank you for for being here. We really appreciate it, and we just we just want to hear from you all. Um, anything you can tell us, and everything you can tell us about your experience with Evita, and also anything else you want to tell us about what you're doing now or how you spent lockdown. Um, but we just want to jump right in. We want to <clears throat> see. Uh, if anybody is feeling particularly chatty, would like to get the ball rolling, maybe just tell us how you got started in Evita. So who can I, I pick? I, I think Andy should start. I, I, Sal, you just read my mind. I, I was going to vote for Andy. Yeah. Because Andy was behind the scenes. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. And so you need to unmute you. yourself, Levy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, only because probably out of all of you, though though the least impactful, I was the first uh, <laughs> uh, to be to be there because I uh, was part of the original production, as was Sal. But I was um, there for the auditions, and I was working for Hal on, on the 20th Century. I was the stage manager, so I'm I'm the behind the scenes guy, uh, never on stage, and. Uh, so, uh, you know, my, most of my stories are those kind of behind the scene. I, it's, it's 30, what, it's 40 years later. I don't know how many years later. It's kind of okay to tell those stories. <laughs> Last time we had a big call with Larry Fuller, I was like, I had a couple of stories, which I didn't get to tell. But then he told them, I thought, God, I did remember it right. And it was as bad as I thought it was. <laughs> so, or, 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 as, or as naughty as I thought it was. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll tell you my very first uh, contact with Evita. Now, you have to understand I was 20, maybe 22, 23 years old. I had just been working for Hal right out of college. Um, and we had gotten very close very quickly. And uh, so he and I was not only stage managing at night, but I was working in his office during the daytime, uh, assisting his casting director, Joanna Merlin. And he comes in one day and he hands me this white album, you know, record album, remember those, uh, this big? And he says, uh, it was a Friday, and he said, listen to this over the weekend and tell me what you think. And it was, it said Evita on it, and it was uh, a, a concert, a concert album, um, starring, um, and the name is slipping in my mind, Elaine Page. Colm Wilkinson, right? Yeah. Covington. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, you guys know better than I. So I, I went home and I listened to it. And um, then I came in Monday morning and just assumed he would have forgotten he had asked me and would never uh, bring it up again. And I was kind of off the hook and I wouldn't have to say anything. Uh, but sure enough, he walks in the door and as Hal does, he looks at me and he goes, what'd you think? <laughs> and I'm like, I, when I said, honestly, I, I, he said, yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, well, I think there's some great songs, but it's a little repetitive. And he said, 
And he looked at me and he kind of had with that twinkly in his eye. He goes, because he was about to go to London to direct it. He goes, just watch me. <laughs> and that, and then of course, you know, the rest is history in terms of what he just listening to the album, it was hard for me to visualize what he ultimately visualized. I mean, the brilliance that he brought to it. So lest anybody think that Hal was not uh, probably the most instrumental element uh, to making the show what it was. Uh, he was able to hear that music and listen to that those songs and really come up with this brilliant concept that totally, totally worked. Um, but I just loved when he said, watch me. And Andy, Andy, yeah. you had that you had when you told me this story previously, you said to me that when you were looking and reviewing the material, you thought to yourself, this is a bunch of vignettes, right? Yeah. And that yeah, I, went, didn't How? Thread. I didn't I didn't see the thread. Yeah, clearly. Um, and I don't remember the, exactly the conversation, but what I remember most was sort of not getting it which is me as a 22 year old burgeoning director not getting it and Hal uh, totally getting it, you know, and being able to take those vignettes and, and, and you know, doing what he did with it. But uh, uh, I will never forget, just watch me, those three <laughs> words. That's great. Yeah. You know, it's so and interesting. Course, you know, I was there during all the auditions and we can get into that later and, you know, uh, the bet between Hal and Andrew Lloyd Webber that Patty, they bet a case of Dom Perignon that <laughs> Hal said, I bet you a case of Dom Perignon that Patty LuPone will win the Tony Award for this. Because yeah. um, Andrew Lloyd Webber wasn't convinced. So, oh, uh, yeah, he wasn't convinced. And, uh, you know, Hal won his. Uh, um, his champagne. <laughs> it's good. It's good. So did, so, we, did we audition? Excuse me. Did we audition in the in the theater? I can't remember. Yeah, we auditioned at the Schubert. Okay. Yeah, and uh, yeah, nothing like it. Yeah, no, it was great. I mean, it was great. Mm -hmm. I, I and I will remember. You know, those final auditions. The women who were auditioning for Evita, they came in dressed. I mean, they came in. You know, because they had to sing two or three songs and they had the gown and they had the, the ratty clothes for when she was, you know, just a, a commoner. And, uh, you know, those were the days when people came to, remember, those are the days before you would do any kind of audition on a video. Mm -hmm. Everything was live and in person and on the stage. And it was uh, amazing. Uh, Sal, do you remember Tyler Gatchel? Oh, yeah, of course. One of the producers? Well, yeah. just to show you my naivete, he walked in the door, and if you have to know what he looked like, uh, to really appreciate this, but I, I, he walked in the stage door and I went up to him because I was running the auditions. I said, excuse me, are you here to uh, audition for a <laughs> He goes, no, I'm the producer. <laughs> Oh, what was playing at the Schubert at the time? Was it, was it a chorus line that was in, in uh, the yes. Schubert? Oh, that must yes. have been. Yeah, um, so it was an empty stage, so it was so easy. It was literally stand on the line. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah and, and believe me, I want to tell you something. When we auditioned the chorus, uh, I, had the, I had the wonderful job of, being, of going up on the line and saying, thank you, no thank you, thank you, no wow. thank you. Oh, I've just gone goose pimply. <laughs> that was fun. That was fun. I hope I didn't get any wrong. <laughs> Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Well, Val, you should tell tell them about your experience with uh, with Hal in the audition. Oh well, it's similar to what Andy said. I actually did bring a change of clothes with me. I started off in a little dance skirt with, uh, you know, my hair hanging straight down. It was down to here, just blah. And uh, once I sang uh, Arge uh, not Argentina, uh, Buenos Aires. He said, okay, can you sing a little Don't Cry For Me Argentina? And I said, excuse me, can I go change? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he had no idea. And Ruthie was right next to him, Ruthie Mitchell. And uh, she said, Hal, she, you know, she wants to change. 
And he said, well, go ahead, honey. And I went off stage to the uh, quick change room at the Schubert Theater in LA, which no longer is there. Yes. Right. And, uh, a beautiful white suit and I uh, put my hair up, I put a little lipstick on, some heels and a pair of earrings. And I just walked out on the stage. And uh, Joanna had, jo Joanna Merlin, the casting director had heard her back. So they had John David Wilder. Does anybody remember John David? Oh yeah, yeah. Very, well, very well. So he was running the auditions. And um, I said, don't announce me. I'm just gonna walk out there. And at that point, uh, you know, Hal kept saying, well, who, who's that? What happened to that Perry girl? And, uh, <laughs> and so John David said, Hal, that is the Perry girl. So um, <laughs> he said, go ahead, honey, you know, whatever. And so I sang that. And and then he said, uh, can you sing a little Rainbow High? And, you know, I took off the, the uh, jacket and I just was, you know, like I was getting undressed for the, you know, eyes, hair, you know, whatever. And, um, and boom, it was just, you know, magical. And he came up to the stage afterwards and, and he said, can you come tomorrow morning at 930 in the morning? And I'm thinking 930 to sing all this stuff. But it was, um, it was really interesting because that day there must have been about five or six of us auditioning the day that I did all the changing. And then the next day at 930, it was just Lonnie Ackerman and I. So they <laughs> pulled it down to just the two of us. And I found out later they just weren't sure which one to do the evenings and which ones to do the matinee. So we had already had the part, but nobody said anything. And uh, I was I was thrilled that I was actually the, the the alternate because you know Lonnie had so much experience she had already been on Broadway, and she was such a mentor to me. You know she helped me to really uh, understand what it was to be in this uh, major production, and and she was so giving and so so wonderful. So uh, the two of us became very fast friends and. Uh, we had a relationship like no other two Avitas, like Avita and the alternate, because most of them were always arguing. Certainly not like the two original Avitas. Oh, no. 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 Yes. no. <laughs> hey, Sal knows. Sal was there. Hi. We used to hear those stories all the time, uh, Andy. I mean, about Terry and, and Patty and, and Lonnie. And I'd say, oh, are you kidding? And I think the thing that really bonded us was right in the very beginning of the show, we were sitting next to each other in the movie theater in those chairs. And the very first time that uh, Larry Fuller was giving the counts on how to cross yourself, you know, he'd say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And Lonnie and I just looked at each other because we were both Jews. Jewish. <laughs> so, you know, and of course, Lonnie says, excuse me for the Jews here. Can you tell us it's if I <laughs> And it was hysterical. We, we bonded at that point. And, and, and then once I was given the Chicago company, we used to call each other like every day. And in fact, when Hal, oh, wow. would, Hal would visit... Uh, uh, LA and then he'd come to Chicago and he'd say something to me uh, try this try that or then he would leave me and go to LA and he Lonnie would call me she says what do you do at the end of uh, a new <laughs> do you do this because Hal's asking me to try this <laughs> so <laughs> go back and forth and uh, you know exchange stuff but she's yeah she was great but that was my how audition story in terms of what Andy said. I, I had the whole, you know, kit and caboodle with me. I thought I, I had absolutely no idea, uh, you know, what it was to audition for this, this big, huge Broadway show. And, and I had no credits, really. I mean, uh, this is how I got my equity card, is doing Evita. Oh, my so, God. Wow. Right out of the frying pan. <laughs> yeah. So... Valerie, I was going to ask you two questions. I was going to ask when you were first rehearsing the the LA production with Lonnie and with Hal, what was sort of the the way that rehearsals were handled? Did you get a, a certain percentage of time or did you just watch? Yeah, that was tricky. That was okay. really because uh, it, it, we did it in the church, the Methodist church here uh, um, in Hollywood. Franklin, right? Franklin yeah. Avenue. <laughs> And, uh, and I remember uh, feeling very left out in the very beginning because, uh, you know, 
the, the core of the people, you know, Lonnie and, and Scott and Sal and everybody that had to go on that first night um, was given plenty of rehearsal. And I was kind of in the background. And I remember um, Larry Fuller would say, uh, okay, we're going to do Buenos Aires. Lonnie, you stand here. And Val, you stand back there, you know, in the background, trying to, you know, figure out all these. And it was very, very frustrating. And then one day, uh, Hal said, Lonnie, take the day off. Val, you're doing the rehearsal. And I thought, oh, man, I was like so nervous, so scared. You know, I felt like I was not prepared. And um, and I remember going in there and and uh, and giving it my all. I, I still felt like I wasn't really ready to do it. And it was like being thrown into the fire and it was scary as shit. <laughs> um, and then afterwards, um, at one point, uh, Hal came back to uh, see one of the shows and uh, and he said, you know, you're marvelous. He said, we, you know, we, it's, it's really great. And, and, it, and it's funny because I never had an Evita score at the time. And I said, do you think maybe I could get the Evita score? I was like learning it from, from you know, albums and, and learning from uh, the ensemble score and just like picking up like tape recording stuff. And he says, you don't have an Evita score? And I said, no. And he turned to, to Larry Blank, who was our musical director, and he goes, Give her your score. To this, <laughs> I have the conductor's score to Evita, all handwritten. I mean, it's amazing. So, um, so it was very, it was very difficult in the beginning being the alternate at this at that point. You know, I I felt that uh, most of the stuff had to be on your own, and uh, I learned a lot by it though. And um, yeah, I. I I think I came out okay, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, have a, all right. I have a quick question for you, Val. Were, were, were you guys who were in the LA production, were you kind of aware of this brouhaha that was sort of carrying on, um, you know, with the publicity of, you know, and, and what we've heard since, you know, supposedly the this so-called rivalry between like the Broadway production and the LA production and supposedly, you know, how going back to them all going, they're killing it out there in LA kind of thing. <laughs> were you kind of aware of that going on or were you just like too much into doing your own thing? Well, I, I think that we were uh, a little bit aware of it um, Lonnie was our Lonnie was our point person. She was would talk to the Prince office all the time. She would talk with Howard Haynes in the Prince office, and she would always say you know certain things. So I think we were aware of it to an extent, but not to what Larry Fuller was saying last yeah. time. He was talking about that. Um, I do remember a story though when Hal came out uh, to see our show, and he was giving notes, and we were all just sitting there, just staring at him. And we're looking up at the, he was showing us the, the murals and stuff and, and saying we had to be one of those characters in the murals. And, and, uh, and we were all just staring at him. And at one point he turned to, I don't know, Sal, if you remember this, he turned to us and he said, what's the matter with you people? What is the sun rot your brain out here in LA? <laughs> 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 Absolutely, like we were just mesmerized by Hal Prince, but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> That's how he busted us in terms of the New York company in L.A. The, the sum was was just, you know, killing our brains. <laughs> Gosh, that's awesome. And, and Val, how long was it, uh, how long had you been doing the show in L.A. before they decided to send you to Chicago? Uh, six months. I did six months there and, um, and then I was uh, flown to New York to do all of the fittings for uh, Evita to have my wigs and wardrobe and shoes and all that stuff. And to do publicity, I, I did a um, I did a thing with Patty once where uh, I had it was for the Associated Press, and I went backstage. I remember uh, knocking on her door, and I said, "Hi, you know, I'm Val, and I'm going to be doing a, you know." And she was this very strong presence. <laughs> Come in, honey. You know, <laughs> and I sat there, and the people were late. The Associated Press was late. And uh, there was like this hockey game. She had a television in her, her dressing room. I was just this little kid, like in a candy store. I'm just looking around. 
I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm in Patty LaPone's dressing room. And, uh, and meanwhile, this hockey game, and she was dating this hockey player. You know, she says, what do you think of him? Isn't he great? Look at that. <laughs> and, and she was meeting him after the show. So she says, if these people don't get here soon, you know, I'm going to just have to. So they knock on the door. She goes, you're late. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And it was so funny. So she pours the champagne. She toasts, you know, they wanted a picture of us toasting, you know, the uh, New York toast, the new uh, Chicago Evita. And, uh, and so then she kicks the guys out after they take their picture, she kicks them out and she goes, drink up, honey, whenever you want to leave, you know, you can leave. I got to get out of here or whatever. And she was, she was amazing. I got to tell you, I love Patty. I love Patty. It's always <laughs> So did, she have any, did she have any words of advice for you or was, was she too busy? You, I'm like trying to get out, <laughs> out there. <laughs> she did not say anything. Uh, she did not say anything to me um, in regards to the character whatsoever. Oh, right. Okay. That was kind of like her thing. You know, I, I, I complimented her and said, wow, you know, I mean, that second act, you were just amazing and mm. this bad and whatever. And she goes, oh, thanks, doll. Thanks, doll. You know, she, <laughs> <laughs> um, just so loving and you know over the years she's been doing shows you know with Mandy she did a concert and every time she's here and I call and I you know I go to the stage door whatever she says come on back she's just always very sweet and in fact I remember one time she did that one show uh, I think it was at the Amundsen and I went backstage I had my family with me I had my two boys and my husband and there were all these celebrities that were standing there waiting to get in. And the doorman came over and he says, and you are. And I said, well, Patty doesn't know I'm here. My name's Valerie Perry. You know, I, I've done Evita and we know each other from those. He goes, hold on. And so he goes in and he comes back out and he goes, Valerie, come on in. <laughs> and all the celebrities are waiting out there. And I just thought that was the sweetest thing. You know, she, she was, you know, she's just a doll. She's really great. But um, anyway, so six months before I got that chance. And, uh, and then it was, uh, it was fabulous. And that's where I met Tony. Ah, so. excellent. Nice segue. And, and you guys did a whole brand new rehearsal process, like basically birthing that production, right? Like you started from scratch. Oh, you mean in Chicago? In Chicago, what? yeah. Well, originally, uh, John Herrera was doing uh, Che. Mm -hmm. And when, when John left, uh, Tony took over. So we, I don't, you kind of were like uh, just thrown in there, weren't you? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it happened. I, I was actually the, uh, it happened pretty uh, sort of quickly. And uh, I mean, it was the same, you know, sort of the origin stories of it. Um, uh, I was in Chicago. And uh, working on this brand new little musical called "Do Black Patent Leather Shoes Really Reflect Up," and was in the original company of of that musical, and uh, and then uh, was doing some other studying and and working there. And this Evita audition was going to happen with a point of origin company in Chicago, and got called in. And initially, I got called in to uh, uh, from a Goldie, and so came in and sang. Uh, um, on this night and then had to sing, uh, uh, they asked us to sing um, uh, Tom Jones song, Delilah. <laughs> so <laughs> sang that too, you know, wow. to sell it. And, um, and uh, it was uh, at the time of the audition, it was uh, John David Wilder and Paul Gemignani and, uh, and Ruth Mitchell came out and did the, the, uh, the, the initial Chicago auditions. And uh, it, you know, seemed to go very well. And, uh, and then at the end of it, uh, uh, they sat me down and, and John David was, was conducting and, uh, the audition. And he said, uh, okay, you know, uh, just, if you wouldn't mind, just, uh, uh, wait for one minute and, and, uh, we're going to, we want to, we want to discuss something and then call you back. And I said, okay. And, uh, so went outside and they said, come on back in. And they said, Okay, so we're we're gonna call you back. I said, great. They said, but we're not calling calling you back as Magaldi. And I said, oh, okay. And they said, so uh, we want you to have you have you do you know are you familiar with the role of Che? And I said, 
a little bit. He said, well, work on it. We're going we're gonna to call you back as a check. And I said, okay. So went home and, and, and started working on it. And um, John David Wilder called me up on the phone. And, and he said to me, uh, look, um, he said, I think, you, I think you can do this role. And uh, he said, but I need you to do some, a favor for me. And I said, okay, and he, what's that? And he said, I, I want you to like, I want you to tone yourself down. And I said, well, what do you, what do you mean? And he, he said, well, you're, you're, you know, you're Italian, you're very Italian and very kind of street. And, and, and I want you to like take the edge off of that as, as much, you know, because you're, I, I, I think that Hal's going to respond better. And I said, okay, I'll try. And, and I, if I understand what you're asking me to do. So came in and, and, and sang and it was, um, and uh, the audition went really well. And about a day or two later, John David Wilder called me up and said, well, you blew it. And I said, what, what do you mean? And he said, you're, you're, you're in the show, but you're gonna be the understudy. And, and I said, okay. And it was, well, what do you mean I blew it? And he said, he, he said, you didn't do what I asked you to do, to tone it down. I said, I, I, I thought I was doing exactly what you were asking me to do. And he goes, no, 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 you're gonna learn the, you have to learn the hard way. <laughs> so um, I was understudy and uh, the, um, but, you know, and I'm, I'm one of the few who has the, uh, you know, the, the wonderful pleasure of being opposite Val and being opposite Lonnie too. And having these wonderful Evitas as well to work work opposite, and I mean, and I have to say, it's some wonderful Perones too, along the way, and, and Rob Altman and, and David Cryer and, and a few others. The uh, the um, and so the what happened was same thing. You know, they said go out and really learn it, and I, um, you know, um, I just really sort of like immersed myself into the work, and thank God I did a lot in the same way, like with. What, what happened with, with Val. Um, on the 13th day that we were in rehearsal in Chicago, uh, we were running through some material and it was the end of the day. And Paul Gemignani said to John, okay, I want you to, to uh, why don't you take a break and just relax? It's because we've been doing a lot of singing. And he said, Cravello, you, you know the role, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, okay, you're gonna sing the chorus rehearsal. So that was my first opportunity to like go through all the material and uh, you know, and it, that seemed to go well. And uh, over the course before John left over the course of that first, you know, these roles, typical and the way Andrew writes roles for men and, and, and really for women, it's, they're so bloody difficult to say is, <laughs> is the bottom line. And, uh, and, you know, you've really got to be on your toes. And so uh, it, during, during that time, um, I had, I, in the time during Chicago, I actually got, a, uh, got to do a, uh, um, a lot of performances. It was, it was close, about the equivalent of about two, two months of the first four months. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it, it, you know, and it's just that that, that role of Che is just a, a wonderful role. And I, I have to say that, um, I'm not particularly, you know, we're, what Andy was talking about before, that original concept album that, that Andy was, was handed and, and the, the orchestrations of it were so much more, uh, more akin to uh, Jesus Christ Superstar and the rock and roll edges of it. One of the other brilliant things of Hal Prince in the reconceptual, uh, reconceptualization of the, and conceptualization of the show was that he had, a, he had that that score, you know, Larry Blank and et cetera, fully orchestrated. And, and it is to me, you know, and, and having done, done Phantom too, for, for Hal and for, for Andrew, uh, to me, Evita and the orchestrations of the original orchestrations of Evita are some of the most powerful. I mean, I remember first time you hear when that, you know, after the death and it goes into when the orchestra really kicks in the first time, I'm getting chills saying it. Uh, it, it, it's a really, there's, it is, you know, that powerful first moment of Phantom 
uh, that is that bam, ba, 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 well, ba, da, 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 da. When you hear that orchestrated, fully orchestrated, you mm -hmm. know, it just, it, it, it really does, you know, send chills. I think that's also why, why, you know, this, the, even the, 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 the so-called rivalries and all that between companies and, and, and uh, you know, what was going that little back behind the scenes scuttlebutt. It was it, it was also be, because of the fact that the 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 word was out on on the show about how how wonderful a piece it was and and how it, at the time groundbreaking. I mean, I'll never forget in the first time I saw it at the you know end of first act those torches coming out on stage and those banners dropping and I mean you know it, and I see Val clutching her heart. I mean, it was a there were mind boggling concepts. That 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 Hal, you know, with the creative team and and the designers had incorporated into it, and so you very much wanted to be a part of Evita at the time, and and because of the fact that it as you know as as uh, you know Weber and Rice wrote um, the lyrical content and and the and the uh, and the rock edge edges to it, and and what what you were able to do as a performer. Um, you know, it just there were there were so many areas that that performers, especially doing those those roles, those lead roles that you could explore. And, um, you know, it was that that show then eventually, as, as Val said, then six months in, um, you know, took over the role and then and then wound up doing it uh, on the road for a bit. And then and, and then eventually on Broadway coming in at the same time uh, that uh, that Lonnie. Uh, was uh, was coming in from Los Angeles to to uh, take over on Broadway, and I came in at the exact same time because they were making that change. And I, you know, I remind people that the the original reviews of of uh, of from specifically from the New York Times were not great reviews for Evita. I mean, it's the same thing that happened with Le Miserable. Mm -hmm. um, you know that the critics didn't like it, and it was just audience word of mouth and. And and just how people were responding to it, and and obviously performers were responding to it, actors and singers were responding to it, saying, "Oh my God, I you know I would love to have an opportunity to 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 do these wow. roles," and um, you know, and it won a million Tony awards. Say that wow. again, Andy. It won a million Tony awards too. And so yeah, great, great as well. Yeah, including as you said, uh, Patty Lapone. You know, right? Exactly. You know, and I mean, and 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 you know, uh, frankly, you know, even the work uh, that Bob Gunton did in that original production was just phenomenal, as well. Yeah. And and you know, the the I go, I was saying before about the changes with the orchestrations, with now even this new conceptualization of the show, as well. You the the and he's he's a he's credited, but but the the combination of Hal Prince and Larry Fuller yeah. creating this show. And Larry's choreography, you know, was just brilliant. It was brilliant conceptually in what he did and, and just, you know, and how even the character of Ava flowing in and out of numbers and, and things like that. And, and, and it, it just, you know, when I, in, you know, and, it, and nothing against the, the creatives of the, of the new version and all that, but, mm -hmm. And obviously, they've got to come up with new concepts. But that original concept was just mind blowing. And, and, and I add to that, Tony, that one of the things that uh, I found most disturbing about the newest version is that it it, it there was no metaphor anymore. It, everything was almost Disney esque. The sets were beautiful and everything else. But Hal Prince and and uh, um, try, I'm blanking on who did all the set design. They designed that steel because that Robin was Wagner. Robin oh, Wagner. Robin, thank you. Yeah. That was supposed to be the steelness of the Perones, you know. Oh, yeah. And that was completely lost in this this new version. So well, I, see, I don't know if you remember what Hal said at the first rehearsal. And I'm going to try to reconstruct this because I, I tell this story. He said, there's no set in this show. There's a door mm -hmm. and, a, and there's a bed and a door and a microphone. 
And that's right. all there is because she used the bed to get through the door to get to the microphone. To the microphone. <laughs> and that's, that's what he said on the first day of rehearsal. There is an iconic photograph, and Sal Mastretta is part is in that photograph. It, and it's, um, uh, um, oh, the number where they're dressing Ava. Uh, um, oh. I flying a door. I fly. Not flying high, flying a door. It's oh, I is here, Rainbow high. Rainbow high. Rainbow high. Rainbow high. Rainbow high. And how about, you know, you talk about the lighting too, those lights underneath. And that's why I say, I say Sal because. You, Cell was like, oh my God, yes. He yes. just did the pose. Cell just did the pose that was there. And those, that group of men around her, or those lights when that, when that screen, the first screen, when it starts to rise and go over the, 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 the Descamisados who are sitting in the theater, and you see those skull shadows that, that happen. I mean, those, the particulars of those concepts and the way it was presented, it was, you know, I'm, again, it's one image after another image. And, and you know, uh, all of that, even the way the show started with that, that footage of, of Ava, the, the real footage of Ava Perone. And, you know, and, uh, and the, you know, the slides that were incorporated and things like that, just, it, it was such a, a, a brilliant concept all the way around. Agreed. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just as an, <laughs> audience goer or audience member I was 12 I think when I saw this show the first time with the Schubert in LA and I mean I loved theater but I had never seen anything like Evita and it just it was so dangerous and it just it felt unsafe and like like it was coming like it was like coming off the stage like you're sort of enveloped in what was happening and it, it was fantastic but it also kind of freaked me out I didn't sleep you know the first night that I saw it, I was just like my brain just could not stop with the images, like you were saying. I just couldn't stop seeing the pictures. I'll go with that one as well, John. I was I was the same age when I first saw it, the the first UK tour, and it was just, I, I, I it, you know, it scared me. I, I loved it. I just, I didn't, you know, I didn't quite know what was going on. I didn't understand everything, but I just knew I had to go back and see it again. And I just, you know, it just. Um, it was just breathtaking. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I was used to seeing fluffy shows like Joseph, you know. <laughs> so it was a real opening into sort of serious musical theatre for me, you know. Well, and I, I think that was the thing about it was it felt realistic. It felt real. Mm. It felt political. And it really did feel like there was an element of, of danger um, that was really thrilling. You know, like, you know, growing up in, you know, in Orange County, uh, you know, super bougie middle class in Orange County, and then suddenly you're thrown into the, you know, the flaming torches and banners and cigars and like all of it, you know, it was just, it was a lot. It was a lot to process. <laughs> I, I have to say also, you're talking about the tension. And again, this is, I, I, I don't mean to to be uh, battering the, the new concept. And I think that it's it succeeded in many ways. But, but the, the, the change from of the of the 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 dynamic and the character change of the of Che uh, from being an antagonist and yes viewing um, and but but at the same time presenting a uh, um, a uh, a rival point of view that was antagonistic between himself and the Peron, Peronus versus the uh, I forget what the name of the film is that was Che Guevara that was young Che Guevara something diaries i forget oh, motorcycle diaries motorcycle, motorcycle diaries yeah motorcycle diaries using that concept and making che a bit of an everyman it took an edge off and i'm i, I want to point yeah. to sal too the the and saying that even the tension that, that was there with magaldi as well in that early part of the uh, part of the show which helps to set up i mean you know that magaldi who is the star and then became a pawn, as and as Andy had said, as a means of going through a series of doors to get to the microphone. You got to talk about that too, Sal, as well. And that and and Magaldi. Well, I'm just, I, I'm, oh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say on that same point that Tony was making. I think that this new production is much more presentational, and Hal always wanted it to be confrontational. Mm -hmm. He didn't. He wanted to make the audience squirm. 
He wasn't there to make them, you know, feel good. And he didn't even, I mean, there were plenty of times where, you know, people would say, well, why wasn't there a blackout? He didn't want a blackout. He would have whiteouts, you know, because he didn't want people to applaud yet. He wanted everybody to be very uncomfortable in their seat. I remember when we were rehearsing uh, Sal, the uh, 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 good night and thank you. At the very end, when we, there is no one, no one at all, that whole thing, and, it, and, it's, and it's dissonant sounding. And he okay. always say he wanted us to point to somebody in the audience at the end. You're the same. And he wanted you to pinpoint them so that they were squirming in their chair. That's the way Hal wanted, the, you know, the audience to feel. And, and at he wanted the end, all his shows to be that way. Yes, that's true, Andy. <laughs> I mean, you're right, about. Andy. It's so funny you, you met, you're both mentioning that because... Um, when we had Mark Ryan in, in the first um, Vita chat and the first and second ones, he said um, originally when David Essex was playing, he played it very much as, you know, he was like a narrator and he was, wasn't there to really, he was just was there to move things along. And then when they rehearsed the Broadway cast and he and Hal came back and just as Mark was take, taking over the role, he said, I want you to attack her constantly be that other opinion. I want you to be aggressive because of the dynamics between what in the work that Patty and 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 Mandy did. It was very, it was some, you know, it was it was very much that rather than um, you know, David kind of, you know, was this everyman kind of character. So um, but he said, yeah, he wanted that confrontation. Um, from the start and that other opinion, you know, to be, you know, to reflect, you know, almost like holding a mirror up against her and showing he being the voice that shows the flaws of her, that she's, you know, as as the the story unfolds kind of thing. And like you said, as well, confronting the audience as well, mm -hmm. you know, um, it, you know, I, it just, um, I mean, it was there from the, you know, by the time I saw it, it was all there with, with all the with the next generation of um of people and um you know we've had people like um John Barr who 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 said you know that was the kind of instruction he got from from Hal as well when he was rehearsing and he was like the next generation down so it's um it, that that production like like you said it was it, it was it's it was unlike any other you know it was um it for us over here it certainly was groundbreaking so um and it's one of uh, the, the show, the, 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 excuse me the show uh i don't want to say drags you pulls you through it as a performer mm -hmm. and as the audience it's non-stop 90 minutes bang 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 and uh the cool thing that that we all as performers especially uh i think f found is that you we could within within the parameters of of, of the concept that he created uh do many different things, think many different ways within, within the thing. I found my way through that show uh, during our scene with um, uh, uh, Ava Beware of the City, Ava, Ava Beware of this and then Beware. So he starts out patting her on the head, then looking her in the eye and then going, well, she's, she's a bitch, she's gonna work with, you know, like there's a progression within, within that. And uh, I wound up doing the, the nightclub scene, the say the song with an accent, and then dropped it immediately. Ah, the audience here sitting on their hands, you know, and it it was it was shocking and different. And I thought I'm going to try that. That's kind of, but there was so much in it that you can play with. I, uh, we, we were talking about um, the auditions and stuff. I I auditioned for it. Um, I was doing on the 20th century at the time. And that was going on tour with Rock Hudson and Judy and all that, all that, and Imogene, you know. So I had a job. Germaniani came to me and goes, aren't you going to audition for a beat? I go, why? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he says, because, uh, you know, it's a Vita. I said, well, so what? I said, what am I going to do? I said, you already cast uh, Mark Sires. I said, in this role, in the role that I'm right for in this, why should I go in a parallel thing in, in another chorus? You know, I felt I felt it was time. I was thirty something years old at the time. I you know I had I looked younger, but I you know, I'm seventy six. I looked you know whatever. And um, you wind up 
he kept bug bugging the shit out of me. Audition, audition was every every time I saw him, I went, okay, okay. So I thought, what do I do? Well, I didn't do the Tom Jones song. They didn't ask for that. Yeah. But they, but they, but I thought, what do I sing that's similar? And that, and I thought of well, the last part of that hugely long song, begin the beginning. And then I sailed it right up to a nice high B flat, you know, and that was it. But when we went to LA, after I did it once in New York, I got it to go on once in New York with Patty. And then he he told me I was going to LA, you know. So we go to we go to LA and I'm sitting there in the in the church at Highland and Franklin. And I had a friend in the, the company I'd worked with in 73, Wayne Scherzer. He was in the ensemble. And uh, we made, I made a lot of friends there and loved it. And Ruth Mitchell came up to me and she goes, you know, you're not, you know, you, you know, you've already gone on, you know the role, blah, 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 blah. And in the original, I, I was sort of the, the prow of the, of the aristocrats, the, the boat with the long cigarette holder. Bob Gutton used to call me razor hips. <laughs> and uh, uh, um, she said to me, would you mind staging the, uh, the uh, aristocrats? That was a bitch to do that number. And because it was five, six, eight, seven, you know, and all touching, all turning around, all this and that. And uh, we, so we, I had a ball doing that. I just, so I sort of, I'm unsung hero for that number, but I loved doing that. It was so much fun. And um, <clears throat> when Val came in and we were working with her, she was on fire, you know, from, from our end of the views, you, you were just flawless. And uh, I did, I, I, they took me out of that, put me in Evita. I toured with Evita and perchance, I toured Evita through Chicago while Val was there with Evita. And that's how I met Tony. One night in Val's apartment at dinner. And, I, and he was so funny. I could play this goddamn role. I'm gonna do this fucking role. And I went, yes, you are. <laughs> Yes, you are, and you did, and you did it great. So uh, the the history with that show, and then I went back to it. Howard Haynes brought me back in uh, when Darren Altai did it, I think, in uh, on a tour, and uh, it's just great history. But through all of that, the the energy and the uh, thrust and the push in that show uh, stimulated you and and made you want to want to do more and just eat it every night you know and the audience too and it, it, uh the very few shows did that they may have a number or two in that and they have you know things you know where that pull you there but this show was non-stop for 90 minutes of that my favorite moment of memory in that show was opening night when patty did uh, uh that's what they call me so lauren but call me and bacall was in the fourth row <laughs> you know, she wow. right at her, just right at her and gave it to her, you know and uh you know I, I later worked with betty and she was just great but um what what a what a history we all have had with this you know and andy was like there at the at the, at the concept at the beginning so that has to be gold for you because the learning process you know well, just, i can see this good well, I mean, like you, I mean, my the beginning of my career was on the 20th century, Evita and Sweeney Todd. Right. right. That's how I learned everything that I then yeah, yeah. Uh, used in my career. Yeah. And, it, you know, it was the people said to me, why didn't you go to grad school, drama school? You did. I said I went to the best drama school imaginable. Right. You know, uh, just... I went to the Hal Prince School of Drama. And to... School of Musicals. To watch the other, the uh, different people come into the roles and do things uh, to it and, and add things to it or maybe don't understand this, or, but, but it was just fascinating to me. Because basically I was groomed as an actor. I just happened to sing well and I could dance. So I worked, you know. <laughs> but in the, in the meantime, you're always looking for, for that inner thing and, and that substance. I say to the kids that I work with now, I said, you can be flashy. I said, you always have to have result first or you're not gonna get there, but then you can substantiate it as you, as long as you're in a long, long enough run, you know? And you start to find all this great stuff in there, these treasures. And um, 
my favorite treasure was I wrote goodbye Val in my in my uh, <laughs> my hair uh, when I was when she was leaving. It was it was my last performance in L.A. before leaving for Chicago, and and I'm sitting at the table with the family, and and Sal finishes singing on this night of a thousand stars. He's wiping under his pits and everything else, and he's coming over to the table, and he sits down. And he just kind of flashes in my, and on his sideburn, it says, bye, Val. And I was oh, like, yeah. I just lost it. Uh -huh. uh, well, with, with, with when Lonnie left, when I was leaving to do Sweeney, yeah. I had to do something to say goodbye to Lonnie. So I, I had put myself into the, into the crowd in the, uh, the balcony oh. scene. I wore one of the old ladies' dresses. I wore my Magaldi boots. I had a sweater over over the thing and a wig. <coughs> and I kept my spangled Magaldi belt on, and I covered it with the thing. So <laughs> Lonnie spotted it right away. And then she, and when she went, "Have I said too much?" I went. <laughs> and I opened I opened the thing up with, with the, the spangled the spangled uh, thing. Well, we 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 heard it, and it was just great. I have great great memories with that show, and uh, the, well, the, the best thing about it, I think, is is what I what I said before was that we could find our way through that and give whatever we all needed or wanted or found, and it was perfectly acceptable, you know, because right. there's nothing written except the lyrics, right? You know, I think it's very good about allowing space to do your own thing. Oh, you know, yeah. he would, he might say, try something. And then he'd go, nah, I remember doing the um, uh, new Argentina, you know how Patty Lapone used to always do like this on her head. Every time he'd <laughs> say, uh, uh, then again, we may be foolish not to quit while ahead. And she'd do this huge gesture. And he asked me once to try it. And I tried and he goes, you know what? It doesn't work on you. Yeah. You're tiny. That, nah. He said, do what you're doing. He said, I like what you're doing, but mm -hmm. you know, he, he did give you that room and it, and it was great. And I think also this, the show was so special because we, we were doing something that was not a happy comedy. I mean, it, there was so much tension. There was, uh, you know, a, a dark ending and we had to get our own humor. We had to make our own humor as, as, so we didn't explode. So as performers, we used to do a lot of joking and kidding. I mean, you know, it's how we stayed sane. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I can imagine, you know, with such weighty subject matter and you, I'm sure you do. Otherwise you would just sort of sink into the, the, you know, the, the morass of it. But, um, God, I, we'd love to hear more of, uh, you know, any of your, your funny stories like that are, are great. Um, in fact, I was going to ask you a question Val. I heard a story somewhere and I can't remember where, um, about the staging of the high flying adored scene in Chicago when Ava's at her dressing table doing all the stuff while Chase sings to her and her back is to the audience. And did I hear that Hal called that backting? <laughs> well, I didn't never, he never said backting, but, uh, but we refer to it as back acting. Okay, okay. So this, by the time the story telephoned its way down to me, yeah. it was backting, which is great. But, <laughs> That were that were that were back acting. That was one spot where you were, you know, at the dressing table, um, and you had to uh, be able to deliver that fatigue. And the other spot was uh, right after. Oh, what I'd give for a hundred years! And then she turns around and she walks uh, upstage. That was the other back acting because you didn't see her face, but you knew, you know, that was her first, uh, you know. Uh, uh, indication that she was ill. Um, so you had to show through walking upstage, the, your back had to show the, the uh, collapse almost of what was going to happen when she walked off. Those were the two back acting moments. <laughs> back acting. Well, and that moment is so powerful too. I mean, I can still see it. The thing that amazed me at the first time that I saw it was as Ava takes that slow walk upstage, the lights that are next to her dim as she passes by and it's like it's like her life force waning you know it's it's incredibly moving um and it's just one of those things it's it's 
it was so effective, but it was so simple at the same time. It, was, it takes a genius to come up with a simple idea, right? <laughs> Those light panels were spectacular. Mm -hmm. You know, you up in Buenos Aires and you felt the flash of the big city. And then symbolically, uh, those lights started to dim as she walked up. She made that. So again, everything was so symbolic with his staging and with the lighting and all that. It, it was just a, it's just a brilliant piece. The original staging and everything is brilliant. Uh, it is, it is. And, and I was going to say too, I think with Evita, another interesting parallel is that it reminded me so much of like later when I started going to opera and I didn't necessarily speak enough Italian to follow the action, but the story was so vivid and those symbols like that were so vivid that even if you didn't speak a word of whatever language the show is in, I think you'd get most of it. You would get the, the emotion of it um, just by the way it's done. And I, I can actually vouch for that because I've seen some foreign language productions of it uh, over here in the Netherlands, they have a completely different libretto for it. They've actually had two different librettos for it. And it still just nails, you know, it still just kills because it's that combination of the music and then whatever libretto they're doing it to, you know, fusing it together to tell that story. And it's just, it's just such a powerful piece. Um, not too many like it, you know, I mean, we, we were lucky to have Evita and Sweeney Todd, weren't they like a year apart? Yeah. <laughs> Close together. As a matter of fact, I remember uh, when I was doing uh, Chicago, it was a matinee, and Hal had uh, called me and said, you want to come with me to see Queenie? And I said, yeah, sure. Uh, I wasn't on. Uh, I had my alternate on, and he picked me up uh, in a car, and we went over there to the Erie Crown is oh. where. Uh. <laughs> And um, I remember sitting, sitting with Hal in the audience and he was squirming. He, he just, he, he wasn't a sit stiller. <laughs> but, um, and it was the scene with Corelli on top where I turned to him and I said, God, that's so brilliant. What did you, how did you come up with the concept of, of putting it on top like that? And, you know, and, and I, was, I was going through the whole thing and he said, you know, I have no idea. <laughs> he said, I have no idea what it was that possessed me to do that. And then uh, throughout the thing, he just was squirming till finally he said to me, you know, honey, I'll see you at intermission. He said, I, I'm too nervous. Cause I think it was either a last dress rehearsal or opening, I can't even remember. But he went out into the lobby area and, and I met him afterwards. And uh, he was just too nervous to sit there and watch. He didn't like watching his work you know, like that, you know, he, he, he want, he was listening to the response and he was what, it was just too much for him, you know, anyway, which reminds my, my, my opening night gift for Hal, for Evita, I found uh, at the water tower place, this uh, store that had these wonderful little trees and there was Mazel Tov, I don't know. And Sorry about that. <laughs> And there was this, this kinetic figure, it was called the walking man. And it just, you, you, you turned it on and, and, and it just kept walking. And it just reminded me of how, and, and I was at Water Tower Place purchasing this. And uh, all of a sudden over my shoulder, I, I hear this voice that says, you know, you shouldn't spend your money until you know you're a hit. <laughs> and, I and it was how, and, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I remember giving him that and uh, and Judy and I and Hal were in the back of this car and Judy said that gift was Judy, his wife, that gift was absolutely perfect because Hal never stops. He just, <laughs> you know, we were, I think we were all shocked when he, we pa he passed because we, I know I thought he would live forever. I, I just never thought of him ever going, you know. And, I mean, it's such a giant, such a giant. Did you guys see that they named the uh, the chandelier in the, I think the Tel Aviv sit down production of Phantom, they always give the chandelier a name and they named that one Hal <laughs> in honor of his, his passing. So I thought that was a really sweet story. It was, I think that was right before COVID. So you might be able to find something about that if you, uh, if you YouTube it, I think it was out there on YouTube, but uh, I want to ask, I want to ask Andy something, which is Andy, when, all this stuff that Val was talking about with all of that tension and all of that, what was it like in his office when, when I mean, you, you said production after production, 
what was it like in his office and, and, and the, with the characters that were coming? I mean, these Broadway icons going in and out of that, that office, what was that like? You know, I don't remember, I don't remember the, uh, the conflict, honestly, between the, you know, the, the productions. Uh, and, and the one thing that Hal wasn't is someone who, uh, pettiness was something he just didn't, couldn't be bothered with. He just yeah. couldn't be bothered with pettiness. And so it wasn't something that came into the office. The office was, uh, was, was a comfortable place, but it was a relaxed, you know, it was, a, it was business, you know, and it just, there wasn't any bullshit uh in there i will tell you off evita sal will appreciate this um one day i was sitting in the office doing some work for joanna probably looking at uh, your picture and resume val but um <laughs> sondheim walks in and and you just heads right for hal's office disappears into his office closes the door and then we kind of hear it's the pounding and the singing in the background and we hear Hal guffawing and when it's done he opens the door and says okay everybody come in here and listen to the funniest song ever written for the musical theater <laughs> and then Steve proceeded to play have a little priest for yeah. us mm -hmm. wow. It was, wow it was maybe one of the wow. great wow. moments of my of my career um to, to see that, but no, I, I, Hal, he just didn't let that kind of pettiness, uh, it, it wasn't him, it wasn't him. And it, very interesting too, uh, he came to LA before, uh, I, he had already told me I was gonna do Sweeney. So he brought me to, we went to LA, we're in LA, we went to some Spanish restaurant, he sat next to me and it was very fidgety. And I, I thought, well, I said, well, what's, what's up? And he says, I have to tell you something. And I'm going, oh, Christ, here it comes. You know, whatever <laughs> it is. You know, and uh, he says to me, well, we're, go we're gonna, uh, you know how the uh, Pirelli song is in three segments or four, I don't remember. I said, he said the beginning, and then there's the, uh, uh, the shaving, then there's the tooth pulling, and then there's the end. He said, we're gonna cut the tooth pulling out of it. So it has a beginning, middle, and an end, rather than two middles. And I went, oh, okay. In the meantime, I had all this physical comedy in my head about that tooth pulling, like W.C. Fields in that segment. <laughs> anyway, um, and he, so we started talking, and I said, well, how does that affect me? I said, I said, I understand what you're doing. I said, does that affect my salary? <laughs> and he said, no. I said, well, then cut what you like. You know, go ahead. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> It, it worked better that way, and and I, uh, but he was nervous to say it to, to me, which was kind of humbling, you know, and I really felt that was kind of cool. And um, anyway, so that, he was a very him. imposing figure, a very imposing man who was not didn't have a, a an ounce of arrogance. No, I, I remember the first the first time I was in his office. Um, I was sitting there, and I'm, he was sitting behind the desk with his a paraphernalia behind him and I was talking to him looking at him like this and then my eyes started to wander all over the 20 bloody Tony Awards and when I came back to him he was just going oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. okay you know well well but, Sal imagine me as a 21 year old oh. kid coming to interview in his office and you walk through the door the big double doors that say George Abbott uh -huh. and, oh, oh. and you walk in and the reception is sitting there and behind her is a roulette wheel. I don't yes. know if you remember yes. the roulette wheel. Yes. And every slot is a show. West Side Story, Fiddler on the Roof, Pajama Game, Damn Yankees, New Girl in Town, oh. Cabaret. <laughs> and you're looking at all this and you want to just turn around and walk out the door again. <laughs> because you think, God, there's just no right. way. There's no way I belong in this office. Oh. Wow. Well, we're glad you didn't turn around. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. The, the, I'm the, glad I didn't turn around, that's for the, sure. The, the interesting thing to me was is that he was always willing to listen. You know, whether he, he used it or not, or whether he agreed or not, he listened to you. And we had mm -hmm. 
a, a session in 20th century. Uh, it was in, in the rehearsal hall and there was something, I don't know what it was, but it was something that wasn't sitting right and all Ruth and everybody were all standing there and talking. And I, I raised my hand to say something about it because, uh, and she looked at me like killer daggers, shut up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then how long, no, no, wait, wait, what, what is it? I said, well, with all due respect, you're not inside the number, we are, you know? And this is what's happening inside the number. And in that pr approach, the validity of what I had to say was, was taken, taken to heart and fixed, you know? And I thought, well, this is how you do it. This is how you shouldn't be afraid. You just say what, what it, I mean, I was older. I was an older guy in my company at that time. But the point is, is, is that the truth is the truth. Let's get it out there. And this is what, what, we, what we're experiencing and you're only looking at it, you know? So I never forgot that. And I carried that with me through all the shows I did for him. That I was never, I had an issue with, with billing at one point. When I came back into, the, into Evita, the fellow who took over my role uh, didn't negotiate or didn't, uh, made them wait. And the poster was printed without, without Magaldi's name on it. And I, I thought, well, whoa, I said, there's only five principles in this thing. And I'm the, what, the fourth? And um, so I called Howard Haynes. Howard, oh, well, you got to negotiate. You got to, and Howard is a friend. I went, Howard, you're talking to me. What the hell's going on here? Well, you got to negotiate that. Now your agent this and that. And he explained to me what happened. And I said, well, I didn't have to do that in the beginning. Why do I have to do it now? So I wrote a letter to Hal. Next printing, my name was on there. <laughs> you know, just, ju I just s stated what, what, I, what had happened. I said, why? You know, the, you know, the human thing, the good thing. What, what, what Andy was saying about not an ounce of arrogance, I, I found that to be the same throughout my experience with Hal. And I found him to be an, an extremely communicator. In fact, even when I left the show, we continued to mail each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how are you doing? What's happening? What's going on with your career now? And he was, he was, I always heard back from him. And, and the last correspondence I had with him was uh, right after I got home from Buenos Aires, my husband had taken me there. Uh, Cliff lives and says, hello, Andy, by the way. Oh, and, uh, yeah. and um, he used to play softball with Andy. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, but I had, I had contacted him because I remember during rehearsals, Hal would say, when you go up there on the balcony, you have to be so overwhelmed that you can't even get the words out. I mean, you are so emotional. And, you know, even if it's, it won't be easy, you know, like you don't have to do it, it won't be easy. You just, you have to have that feeling of that hesitancy. And, and, uh, and I said, okay, okay. And, you know, like Andy, I was very young when I did that role. And, um, you know, I tried my best to do it as best I could. And then when I went to Buenos Aires, I had an opportunity to tour the Casa Rosada. Uh -huh. I remember going upstairs and the guide said to me, now this is the pathway that takes you out to the balcony where Ava would do all of her or or oration. <laughs> so I said, oh my God, I'm going out to the balcony. This is like uh -huh. insane. So as I was walking this pathway, and everything alongside me. And then the doors open, like there were like these big, you know, French door windows. And I walked out there and I looked at this huge square and imagining all those people that were there yelling and screaming. I couldn't fucking breathe. <laughs> I, I could not breathe. And I remember the first thing I did when I got home is I said, Oh my God, Hal! I had an opportunity to do this, and and I and I can't believe it. You were <laughs> right. It was insane. I you know, I just had this, and I went on and I told him this, and he wrote me back and he said, "Oh my God, Valerie, I'm so happy that you got an opportunity to go there." He said, "Isn't it fascinating? You know, Judy and I went, and 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 uh, and Daisy met us there, and we did." And he was just so Hamisha, <laughs> <laughs> just an incredibly humble guy.
And, um, and that was something that I found uh, so incredibly refreshing that with all those Tonys and with everything that he had done and man, I mean, my knees were knocking when I was auditioning for him. I was so nervous and it all went away because he was just the best. He was just the Valerie, nice. Valerie, I, one of the very first things I directed for nothing, of course, on 100th Street at the Trinity Theater on 100th Street and Columbus Avenue in the basement of the Trinity Theater. I directed a production of The Broken Heart by John Ford or Jacob being Revenge Tragedy. Mm. Okay. And one night in one performance, you know, there was like 20 people in the audience, 25 people in the audience. Four of them were named Prince. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the entire family came to my three and a half hour revenge tragedy. And it was, uh, the cast was freaked out. It was unbelievable. But the next day, I see on Joanna Merlin's desk, uh, the program for for the uh, for the production. She says, "You should see this. It's really long, but he's good." Oh, oh my gosh! Why well, oh. could you believe he would schlep up to a hundred Street to see this? You know, cockamamie production that I put on, uh, and and w was supportive, and you know that's what he did. Yeah. I got when, when I got Sunset Boulevard. Uh, uh, what was that? Ninety uh, in L.A. Ninety three, ninety two. I can't remember. Ninety three, I think. And um, I got a note which is up on the wall behind me from him, from him and Judy uh, congratulating me on on getting the the show. Really, yeah, very moving, for sure. Anyway, right, this this right production, about. our production of Vita. All of our productions of Evita are historical. So in my life, all I wanted to do was create something, be in something that made history and work with very famous people. And I did it. <laughs> and we all did it. <laughs> so, they, so there you go. And uh, those memories can never be uh, relived. They can be uh, visited, but these people are gone. And we're, we're, the, we're, the, we're what's left. We're the residuals. <laughs> And, and, uh, you know, and, and to that point, Sal, isn't it amazing how many opportunities that office created for so oh, many oh, people? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It just, oh, yeah. it's unbelievable. And yeah. not only in, in the United States and across this country, around the globe. Yeah. Hey, John, hey Tony, fun fact about John David Wilder. Please. Um, next time you <laughs> see the movie Airplane. Oh, oh yeah. I know. <laughs> oh, you know that. He's, yeah. one of the, he's one of the Hare Krishna, Krishna guys. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. Love it. I, I want to ask too, John and John, it went, did, did, um, did Larry talk about uh, remounting the original production at all? Because I wasn't here for the back end of the, of the, of the talk. No. Did he talk about it at all? Not a lot. No, I, I think he mentioned uh, that he was involved with um, the 20th anniversary production and they thought it was going to right. New York. And he did, he, he mentioned that. Um, he mentioned the Australian production, didn't he? Which, right, um, he talked about that. But you remember he also mentioned that that 20th anniversary didn't go to New York because it turned out that Lloyd Webber and Rice didn't want it to go to New they York. They didn't want it to go in because it was something to do with. They were already they, talking Brandage. Yeah, well, it, was, it wasn't just that. It was, I think it was their contract with Stigwood. Was, yeah. you know, they didn't want any more money going to Stigwood, apparently. So, yeah. <laughs> allegedly, that was the story. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it was their contract with, well, with him was was about to to end. So, unfortunately, that didn't happen. But he he did he did mention he did mention it. Um, some sh some some shows he kind of quickly skimmed over, and others he spent more time on. He was you know, but. Um, you know, as we found out, Larry's Larry, and he's he's really delightful, and um, it was a pleasure to um to to be able to have him um just talk away and just hear his hear what he had to say, and you uh, know, I'll, um, I'll share a little something. That, um, yes, please. I happened to um in New York. I had I had uh, as Val was saying, he was always and and Andy was so gracious and 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 so. He was always so gracious and, and you know, the many things about, about Hal Prince. 
his graciousness. Him always, you write to him, he writes you back a letter. That old school gesture is, is something that is lost um, with people today. And, and um, you know, the easiness of writing an email, that wasn't how prints. Mm -hmm. And, and the, um, in their conversation, he, uh, one of many we had, the, he said to me that uh, he had approached Andrew and said to Andrew, you know, there's one production that I would love to do a revival of, and I would do it exactly the way I did it the first time. And that's Evita. Wow. And Andrew said, that's a wonderful idea. Let me think about it. And that was the, the wellspring for the new version and revival. Mm -hmm. And and the um, and new conceptualization. I mean, that's what I have to put together when I put together two and two. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I believe that there was a production, an original production, that original staging, that was in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And um, and so the what had happened after the fact was that um, the production indeed went to London and then came to Broadway and ended. But there, there remained a, um, the notion of, of Hal and Larry restaging in the original version um, Evita and with the possibility again of it coming into New York. I didn't know that he did, that Andrew didn't want to deal with Stig, the Stigwood. Um, um, their, 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 their uh, heirs or whatever, what was the situation as well. But I know that, I mean, at least from, from Hal's mouth, he had said that that was, that was being seriously discussed. And then unfortunately wow. he passed away. Because there was this, there was this uh, also after the, the 20th anniversary, there was this, I think it was the 2018 production that you're talking about, Anthony, um, or 17, something like that with Emma Kingston in South Africa. And then they brought it over to Australia and Australia said, you have to have Australian talent. So they, they brought Tina Arena in to do it in Australia. And then that production just ended, like it didn't, didn't come to New York. So I think I think I was mixing up my my Evita that didn't come to New York. That was the third one. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. the did the Grandage production, I think, happen in was it two I would Six. say two thousand and six, was it? Yeah. yeah. I thought so, yeah. And then I think the version that would was that um Emma Kingston did in South Africa wasn't that um I think that was a variation of the UK tour, I want to say. Oh, I think it was it was billed as being the the Prince production. It was billed as just being the straight up original production, although right. not all of the music was the same. They still they still uh um have the, the original uh, Buenos Aires dance orchestrations, those were just gone forever, which kills me. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say I'm I'm I rem from what memory serves me correctly, the the um the Australian production used Larry's staging and or uh, tried to do as much of it as possible, but it didn't quite fit in with the new arrangements because a lot of the new arrangements it was uh, you know it was a lot brighter and there was that um, mm -hmm. heavy samba beat going on with it and, yes. and what have you and you know it was it just it didn't quite sort of gel from from what I've seen of, of, of video clips of it and, and stuff, but. Um, the there was a but there was a I, I always mention it um there was this kind of hybrid production that would happen at the solo playhouse i think it was called uh, oh, uh, Florida. Beach, yeah where they use um kind of a hybrid of the old and new arrangements to create their um mm -hmm. their own version of the show and um that was from the clips out there that was quite sort of new and it had a you know the reimagined sort of the opening and she sort of um what what was the i'm trying to be the icarus they use the icarus myth as as um as a basis of it and they had a sort of falling from the heavens back down to earth and she was on wires kind of and all the there was this must have had a fan blowing underneath it because she was had this oh. chiffon on and it was just like she was falling from the heavens back to join you know the, the her desk camisados and it was um yeah it was it it um, was interesting 
-hmm. interesting and it certainly um i think there's um you know the talent is out there for you know for people to reimagine it and 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 stage it but um you know um i think sometimes when it works it works really well and it's it, it'll always be you know i think it will there'll always be comparisons between a, a new version always of course aging because you know it just is so iconic that black box oh, and no, like you said the, the minimalist staging was just you know the the it just i mean jackie said before and i and i, I always quote you jackie um you know it, it, there's just not an ounce of fat there wasn't an ounce of fat on that show it was just a perfect piece of musical theater you know you, you can't how can you top that how can anybody top it it was just genius absolute genius well, then I was going to say, I forgot um, in the, the the vast recesses of my memory, I forgot there was also that tour in 90, was it 93 that you did, Val? Um, um, at 92. We did, we did it together. On it with me as well. Um, uh, gee, I'm trying to think of who the producer was on that. Well, I was trying to think of that. In, in, in Indianapolis, who, was, who, who ran the Indianapolis theater? John Young? No. Um, John, that's it. That's it. John yeah. Young. Um, but yeah, we, but that was, that was, Larry had directed that uh, production. Right. Right. And it was right after my kids were born and, and I brought them with me on the road. I had my twins. They were on, they were on pink contracts. <laughs> <laughs> they were guppies. They were guppies. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> Uh, I, I had a memory that I just, uh, uh, I want to throw it out there that, uh, about the music. Um, in the original uh, production, I, I, I think we had a moment where we were down in the pit and sang with the mistress, uh, whatever. Um, but I remember there being a controversy about the synthesizer against the uh, uh, local 802 uh, musicians union. That they were pissed off that they were that the, but the synthesizer was like so right for that show, you know. But there was a controversy about using it. <clears throat> I have one story about music that you'll all appreciate. I had done a, a regional production of it years later, and the producer of this wanted to use what they call a virtual orchestra. Okay. This. This was like such a new thing where they would only put like three musicians in the pit and whoever was on the keyboard, he played a certain thing and it would be like this, this huge sound of an orchestra, but there were only three musicians in the pit. Wow. I had not known that that was going to be the case. And I remember I had accepted the role and it was supposed to do three cities. It was a three city tour. And uh, the four day I got to the orchestra rehearsal and I looked down in the pit and don't cry for me. <laughs> I looked down and I see three people and I went back and I said to the producer, what the hell is going on? <laughs> there are like no musicians. You know, I'm so well, he said that this is the new concept. They're doing it on Broadway. And I said, oh, no, no, this can't happen. This just can't happen. And, uh, and of course there was a, uh, 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 some kind of a musician's union strike about it and everything. And I was furious. And I remember the city, that, the first city that we were playing, the musicians were all outside handing out flyers. And I came to get ready. You know, I always come like an hour and a half before to warm up and stuff. And I stood out there and I took the flyers and I was like handing out the flyers <laughs> to people because I thought it was just the worst thing to happen to musical theater to lose an orchestra. One mm -hmm. of the things you go to the musical theater to see, you know, is live theater is about watching it happen, you know, not just. Anyway, cut to the chase. The next city, uh, the producer filled up the orchestra pit and he, <laughs> he said, You're absolutely right. He said, I'm sorry, and, and that was that. But I just thought that that was like the death of musical theater when that happened. And I don't know what where it's at now. Um, you know, obviously Broadway's reopening now, and I'd love to be able to go to a show and see if there are actually members down there. But um, that well, was the, a pretty- the, uh, Sorry, the only, the only 
time I had uh, is not issue, I guess it was an issue, was when we did Cats. I did Cats for the, the first national. I did Gus Girl Tiger for two years. And the orchestra was in another room, wasn't even in the theater, you know? Mm -hmm. And the, the and you, you know, you as a performer, you, you want that give and take. I mean, from a, a, a video monitor on a, on a light rail, come on. Yeah. You know, he, he's not getting the, the essence of anything. And they've tried so many things, but the only thing, and you're absolutely right, Valerie, is the, is the reality of the live, live performances being cohesive, you know? Yeah. It does make a big difference. It does. Oh, yeah. Now what you did, you not always go up to the orchestra at intermission and look down there and just be like, yeah. that was just the joy of being at live theater. Well, and I'm sure you guys do the same thing as me. You stick around as everybody else is leaving the theater to hear the orchestra playing the bows and applaud because it's usually pretty thrilling anyway. Um, and I'm trying to remember what an equity uh, or, or or Broadway orchestra is down to now, the, the minimum number, it's getting really low. I think it's like eight oh, or no. 10. It's very low. Um, yeah. I think, so. I think we're worse over here in the UK. I mean, you know, you know, the reliance on on you know um on more on synthesizers and pre-programmed um you know sort of click tracks on on especially mm -hmm. on touring shows it's you know it's just commonplace now but you there are very few shows over here now that you will have a full orchestra you know phantom being the one that um you know that everybody knew still had had that full orchestra and obviously um with what's happened in the past year or so um that's now been reduced so yeah. um it's, 14 people from 30. yeah it's, but it's so sad i want to i wanted to pop in and just give andy a chance to say anything he'd like because i i understand he's got to leave a little bit early um so if you've got some great you know, audition tea or gossip tea, anything like that you'd like to spill. <laughs> Now's the time. Um, oh my God. Well, uh, just trying to trying to think. I mean, there was, uh, I, I'll tell you one story uh, that, ha and, and Patty and I have since become great friends. And, uh, you know, but at the time, you know, I was this, uh, you know, little, You know, squeaker kid, 22 years old, and um, uh, I was stage left during the show, and I was, uh, you know, uh, I was responsible for the slides, so mm -hmm. I was the one that was clicking, you know, the cues for the slides for all the everything that went on the screen. And one night after one of her numbers in the second act, and I think it was Don't Cry For Me Argentina, actually. She came off the stage in an absolute fury and just literally got in my face and said, I have told you 10 times to tell that spot operator to stop talking during my number. <laughs> And I was like, whoa, I was like, I said, first of all, Patty, you never told me that. Because <laughs> if you had told me that, I would have taken care of it. And second of all, don't yell at me. Get out of my face. <laughs> and she, we went through this thing and it lasted the entire second act. She would go on and do high flying adored. Then she'd come off in the wings getting changed and she'd be yelling at me. And I'd say, you know, you need to speak to George Martin who was the production stage manager. She goes, oh, I need to speak to George Martin. I mean, it was like this, we were having this like <laughs> teenage high school argument. I was like this spoiled Jewish kid who'd never been yelled at. And she was like this, you know, Broadway diva who expected a certain level of respect. And <laughs> this went on and on throughout the entire second act. And when the show was over, I went over to George Martin and I said, uh, I'd just be ready for a storm. I said, <laughs> uh, you know, Patty and I had uh, some words during the second act. So I left and I came in the next night, you know, at, you know, an hour before the show or a half hour, whatever. No, I was there an hour. 
And George pulled me over and he said, uh, I need you to go into Patty's dressing room. And I said, I'm not going to apologize. I said, I'm not going to. He said, no, 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 I don't need you to apologize. I just need you to go in there, talk to her. So I knocked on the door and, you know, I heard come in and I walked in there. And I mean, you just, just talk about bizarre reality. She's there with the skull cap on. So, <laughs> so I walk in and there's Pat of the Bone, just, just skull cap, sitting and, you know, putting her makeup on. And she says to me, she says, Andy, I just want you to know one thing. That was not Patty Lupone yelling at you last night. <laughs> that was Ava Perone. <laughs> oh, wow. She was absolutely serious. And I kind of went, okay. See you later. Yeah. <laughs> I just kind of backed out, back out of the room, and that was it. Um, and I actually found out later she had called Hal that day to have me fired. And he said, oh, and he said, it's not going to happen. Wow. That's not going to happen. <laughs> so, uh, and then I have to, and now, I mean, I've got pictures with her and Mandy and my son, you know, in, in his room from all the, she's so sweet. And every time we see each other, it, it, it's just lovely. And that, but that was just this one, she, one incident where I'm sure she was under a lot of pressure and she was nervous and, you know, cause, uh, cause this happened in uh, San Francisco. And so we weren't even open on Broadway oh, yet, oh, oh. but uh, yeah, that was, that's wow. my family story that I will leave you with. But uh, there was a lot of stuff going on. Uh, as we said earlier, there wasn't the love affair between Patty and Terry as there was between, oh, yeah. um, uh, you know, you, Valerie, and Lonnie. It, just yeah. was, it was it was a different time, different. Uh, well, it, it factionalized the company a lot, and I kept away from it because I just couldn't couldn't take it. And it was so silly, yeah, you know, just so silly. And when yeah. Patty was doing her book, she called me and asked me about that. And I said, "Tell you the truth, I said you knew which camp I was in." I said it was yours. I said, but I had no I had no not no specifics about what was going on, except it was just such walking on eggs and silliness, you know, which thank God between you and, and Lonnie, we never had that Valerie, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, I mean, I learned uh, as you, Andy, I'm sure that uh, somebody like Angela Lansbury knows how to make a company happy, you know? And it comes from the top, it comes from Hal, it comes from her, it came from mm -hmm. all of that. And you girls did that. And uh, it wasn't there. I'll tell you something, yeah, Sal, I'll tell you something, I was, Going up to was it Newbury where all the sets were uh, uh, built? Berg. Um, what New what? Berg Newberg. Newberg or something. And I'm literally driving up there with her. I had to drive her up there to get her <coughs> the plaster cast right, made of right. her body okay. for the coffin. Right. And this was before this incident. And so she was telling me about her experience with John Hausman and the, you know, and, and Juilliard and all that. And she said, and this was Mandy and Kevin Klein and, 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 and her and all this group of actors. Yeah. She said, we were taught that no one was going to help us and that we had to, to uh, stick up for ourselves at all costs and no one was going to have our back except ourselves. So that's the, you know, that's the kind of, that's what was drummed into her head as a young actress, you know, and she certainly brought that into the production. <laughs> well, um, how many people... I, I, I do have to run, guys. Um, thank you so much, Andy. Thank you for being here. It was great. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Thank you. Well, it was my pleasure. And it was so nice to spend time with uh, you, Sal, which, and I, I'm going to get to Palm Springs. Oh, good, good. Sometime and I'll see you guys. And Valerie, I haven't seen you in, in ages. And um, Cliff, give my love to him. And Tony, we need to, you know, I hate to sound so Hollywood, but we need to get lunch. Oh, yeah, lunch is, we're, we're, you're on, you're on. Yeah, now, now that we're sort of slightly less pandemic, I've had three shots now, so, you know, you can't touch me. Yeah, I'm looking for my third. <laughs> Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right, guys. Thank bye you bye so Andy. much. Bye, Andy. Bye, Andy. Take and care. I know, that, I know that Tony has to go as well, so we'll we'll let yeah. you uh, 
get any parting shots before you, you head out, Mr. Cavello. I, I have a daughter who was texting me and saying, what about lunch? So, um, <laughs> reality. <laughs> yeah, in reality it slaps you right in the face. You know what I will say with this is that, I mean, I, mean, um, I want to talk a little bit to two, two things. One was uh, the other, uh, like un unsung, and, 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 and uh, Andy was uh, alluding to some of it already, unsung heroes were the stage managers that behind this show. I mean, we had, as you say, George and, and uh, John Grigas was yeah. such a character in New York and, and Tom Guerra, Chris, uh, yeah, Chris Lawton in Chicago. Uh, I, I, you know, they were, they really helped to keep the, um, you know, the, the, the ship and the, and the train on the track and, and moving forward and, and taking care of, care of everybody too. I mean, it was just, it was terrific. And, um, you and know, it was I, Paul. They, show to call it was a big show to have to call oh huge huge and 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 at the time at, you know again groundbreaking and difficult exactly. as well you know and 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 we had you know each one of the company companies also had um you know and it happens when you know when you're doing longer runs and and big runs with a lot of people involved sometimes there's tragedies that occur and 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 you know for them to also just keep the companies together in the midst of some of those tragedies too um was was just you know it was above and beyond the call of duty and i, I have to tip my hat to to all of them the other thing i would say is that you know we, they were we were talking before i think i can't remember it was you it was john one of the johns said about the chandelier was it in germany being named after hal i think it was in tel aviv think, what was that again oh i think it was in tel aviv Tel Aviv, I think. And, 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 and I have to, I'll say this, I mean, and, and I know that that's Sal and Val, I mean, all of us, and, and uh, we'll, we'll, I think, probably echo the same sentiment. Um, uh, we were, Sal and I were, were at the, you know, the um, Hal's mm -hmm. Memorial, and, and I tell you that within, within the masses, and even for those who weren't there, who couldn't get there, who, whatever, you know, the people I said before, the, the impact of Hal Prince uh, uh, on the theater community. And, and, and we all know, I mean, the, the icon that he, that he was and how he was involved in so, so many productions. But it really is time that, that it's got a, either a street or the majestic it, it should be Absolutely. named after Hal Prince. It's really time. And, and uh, you know, it, it is, if, if, any, if anybody, was is deserving it, it is Hal prince and uh you know i i know a lot of people feel the same way ab about that it, it really is his his impact on on you know for all of us i mean he gave us lives he gave us a livelihood he you know and and as val was saying and sal was saying i mean you know he would go that extra mile uh he he was such a gentleman and as as uh, Andy was saying, you know, the, the, the pettiness didn't come into the office. He gave, and I'm talking, it's not only actors, just designers and things as well. I mean, I've heard stories from, from different people saying the exact same thing about him. And, and um, you know, it, it really, um, God willing, you know, as a beacon, as a beacon for future generations, I, I think that needs to, something has to be done in that mm -hmm. regard. I agree. So I will. I will end. I, I will end with, with that one. And I, I just all of you and and then Sal and Val. I mean, how it's always a pleasure, even at a distance, to to be in your company and and everybody here. What a pleasant afternoon this has been, and and it's just it's so wonderful too to hear all of these stories that are either jogging the memory or or new or new tales and stuff about behind the scenes it's a yes evita but even like the stuff that that sal and and andy were sharing about sweeney todd and about on the 20th century and and, and just all of it you know it it is there it's all binding fabric to to what is a large such a large as they say there's only 13 people in all of theater and 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 you know that and that old adage it's just it's just such a it, it's it's the thing that binds all of us as a family it's just it's really wonderful i mean i'm i'm so um i'm so pleased just to be a part of it as well so, we all are we all yeah. are. thank you for all of you for agreeing to do it i mean this is back at you 
um, you know, this is something that was was just done on a whim originally for, from it was a what if kind of idea and then and then it's sort of grown and and i realized i mean it's things are slightly different over over there especially in on broadway than over here but we just don't seem to i realized we didn't have a record of people's of, of experiences of, of you know and working on these shows and i thought we, you know somebody's got to do it and i thought why why shouldn't we and i thought we you know we it needs to be there um for future generations you know with that to hear to hear your experiences of working on these shows it's there forever now you know and it's just so wonderful that you agreed to be a part of it and i can't thank you all enough everybody who has ever taken part in in one of these it, it's just wonderful and um you know for my, for me, to you, all of you, thank you very, very much. It's, it's and just that goes double for me. I just, I can't thank you all enough. Um, we'll we'll give a last call in case there's anybody that's been sitting patiently waiting to ask a question. But I think it's, I think we've taken more than enough of your time. So speak <laughs> now or forever hold your peace if you're in the audience. <laughs> um, but no, really, thank you all so much. It's just, it's been an honor to uh, speak with everybody and to have this little connection with everybody and. We'll, we'll send you a ping when this gets uh, edited and thrown up on YouTube in case you want to share it with, you know, family, friends, etc. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll, we'll do something again in the future. We'll, we'll possibly bug you again sometime unless you write me an email and say, leave me alone, John Rinaldi. <laughs> but uh, we really do appreciate it. You've all been very kind and very generous with your time. So thank you. Thank you just, so much. I'm just nothing that. but the best to all of you. Thank you, guys. All right. <laughs> I think it's one for the books, y'all. Bye. You. Okay, bye, everybody. Thank you again. Be well. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.